Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's 7 o'clock, and I will call the December 10th, 2012 school board meeting to order. If you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Treadway, would you please call the roll? Jokinus? Here. Cheryl Hancock? Oh, she's excused. Nika Jaginski? Here. Kate Mayer? Here. Tim Menier? Um, he is running late. Myself? Here. Brianna Schwabenbauer? Here. Here. All right. Um, notice of quorum with five of the seven board members present, I would declare a quorum. Um, approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. Um, the agenda is amended. We have added items 7.6 and 9.8, and we have deleted item 9.7. Um, with those changes in mind, um, are there any changes anyone else would like to make to this agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I so move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of the amended agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion passes. Um, public participation, if there's anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any, agenda, any item at this time, we ask that a five minute time limit be followed and please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. And don't all rush up at once. No one? All right. Wow, moving fast. Um, board re our <coughs> reports and discussion. Um, high School Entrepreneurship Class Polar Express. This is Bresky. Um, hello everyone, my name is Jacqueline Johnson and this is Gabby Fastnet. We are here tonight to tell you all about our entrepreneurship store called the Polar Express. I'd like to introduce you again to Jacqueline Johnson and myself, Gabby Fastnet, as this year's store managers. We are very excited to be presenting to you today and we thank you very much for your time. Now, the Polar, Expre the Polar Express mission statement reads, At the Polar Express, we will put gifts in your stocking, a smile on your face, and give you an experience worth remembering. If you have any questions throughout our presentation, please don't hesitate to ask, as we'd be very happy to answer any of them. OK, um, so like I said before, Gabby and I are both store managers of this year's um, entrepreneurship store. Um, the, we do a lot of things when we supervise all 29 students within our class. We oversee all the department managers and their members to make sure everything is running smoothly. We also plan, organize, and run many of the events that go on within our store, including voting, class discussions, and decision-making tasks. All of the events, activities, and actions must be approved by each of the advisors, as well as Jacqueline and myself. We also must handle concerns and questions, and as you can imagine, we are faced with many questions every day. Um, through this, we have learned to be very adaptable. Okay, um, within our store, we do have four departments, the first one being promotions. Our promotions team consists of seven members and the department manager is Emily Mahalovic. The promotions team is one of the busiest departments throughout our entire store. They created the logo and store sign. They made advertisements that go all over the community. And they also helped contact local businesses and they planned grand opening. And they also just spread the word about the Polar Express. All right, and like Jacqueline and Gabby said, I am Emily Mahalovic, and I am this year's Promotions Department Manager. I am Brianna Haas. Hi, I'm Jenna Oliver. I am Tia Hawkins. <coughs> and I'm Ryan Weber. Our sales department is managed by Brianna Dahl. Um, as they're coming up, Sales has played a huge role in the contacting of our vendors and determining the merchandise in our store. They have contacted multiple local vendors as well as donators that will feature products in our store. Now that the product is coming into the store, the sales department is, bu is busy managing the inventory and picking it up. We will be pricing and arranging the store which this week, so we're getting very excited. 
Hi, my name is Brianna Dahl. I'm Tara Westfall. I'm Ken Janetta Guide. I'm Joel Preschel. I'm Sam Stotsman. I'm Claudia Becker. And I'm Jamie Theobald. Okay, um, and there is our sales department. Um, next, we have our operations department, which is managed by Haley Shepherdson. Um, our operations department has also many duties within our store. They priced all the items from various vendors, and that's what they've been doing for the past two weeks. And they've also created an inventory system and take inventory on all of the supplies that are in our store. And yeah, so here they are. Hi, my name is Haley Shepherdson, and I'm the department manager. I'm Mackenzie Watson. And I'm Zach Watson. Next is our human resource department, and Sydney Brock is the manager. The human resource department has completed most of their main tasks already. They were in charge of creating a schedule, and each student works about eight hours throughout the week that the store is open. Next, they created an employee handbook that each of the student and his or her parents signed off for approval. Now their last big task is creating a security system, a training video, and a policy for the store while it is open. Hi, my name is Sydney Brock. I'm Brianna Barra. I'm Aaliyah Schuster. I'm Emily Holton. <laughs> I'm Olivia Buckley. I'm Summer Waters. And I'm Zane Finucane. Okay, so in past years, what our entrepreneurship class has done is they went to Walmart and spent around $10,000 to fill our store with merchandise. This year, we're doing things a little bit different. Um, we were at, our task was to find local vendors and ask for a $25 donation, and then they could sell any product they wanted in our store. And as you can see um, on the slide, we were pretty successful with that. Um, sales had a huge part in doing all this, so we are really excited about all of our vendors. Also, our sales department was in charge of contacting donators for our grand opening event. Um, we have listed on this slide the donators that have agreed to give us product to be raffled off at the Polar Express grand opening. Um, so we're continuing to get lots of donations throughout the week. Um, this year, our store is running as nonprofit. All the money made through the $25 donations, as well as any of the vendors that are giving us a profit or a percentage of their profit, um, will be given to a local family in need. We have talked with the guidance counselors at the high school, and they have agreed to find us a family um, that we're going to kind of sponsor for the holidays with gifts, and if we have enough money, hopefully their meal. Um, so uh, our hope is that we can give them an unforgettable holiday season. All right, well, we thank you so much for allowing us to present tonight, and we encourage you to attend our grand opening, which is this Saturday, December 15th. Um, the festivities start at 9 a.m., and they go until about 11. And yeah, we're really excited. Thank you. Yeah. If you have any questions, we can take them now, too. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have questions? Um, I have a question. Um, I just love listening to all of you, for one, <laughs> and just, um, it's with great pride that that board members look at um, all of you who came tonight because even coming tonight is a sacrifice for you um, board meetings aren't really exciting compared to a lot of things that high school students do so I really appreciate you being here one of the questions I have I love that you went local this year um, congratulations you mentioned the sales team and congrats to everybody who brought that idea up I wondered if there's something you are doing as an organization to give to the locals that they can put in their stores that say we are supporting Holman High School in this event so that there is some free advertising for them or do the newspapers know that our local paper yep yeah, um, we actually were just in an interview um, with the newspaper and we told them all about that and also um, within our store we advertise everyone that has helped with vendors and donators right. so in our store but we haven't looked into putting in yeah. there so that's a good idea Maybe a little poster that says I support right. my local high school yeah. and my local education idea. system um, that would give them some some free perks um, um, again thank you for what you're doing I have a daughter that went through the same thing okay. several years ago and right now she's marketing manager at Wells Fargo and in charge of also um, um, finding charities for all of the Wells Fargo, she calls them suits, 
um, in Minneapolis. And so your combination of a charity and a small business to me is what America's all about. <laughs> just to be a little political, I'm just so proud of everything you're doing. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a couple, a question and a comment. So um, my question is, what do you think will be the hot seller this year? Because I know when my kids were in high school, they had like the, they would have the Holman seats for the, like the stadium yeah. seats. Yeah, they'd have the, one year. Mm -hmm. the combo t-shirt and sweatshirt packs. So what's the big seller this year? Um, well, something we're doing a little bit different this year is we're also open the mornings for students <laughs> and during their lunch period. So we're selling like hot chocolate and candy and those kinds of things. So um, although they're low priced, I think they're going to go quickly because it's something quick and low priced and easy for the students to buy. Um, so we I think all, yeah, we also have a lot of pretty jewelry. So I think when um, the teachers are invited to our soft opening on Thursday, so hopefully they tap into all of our jewelry that we have. So mm -hmm. I'll see. It's kind of like a mini craft show going on at the high school right now. <laughs> For the millions of people that are watching tonight that right. maybe have never shopped in this store, how will they find you? Um, well, we are. Um, we've advertised all over that we are in home and high school. and. Um, but once they get into the high school, tell right. them how to get to um, your place. We do have a lot of window paint up that says, go this way, go this way. We, we're in the process of more posters to direct them towards where we're going. And the nice thing is at our grand opening, there's also a youth basketball tournament. So there'll be already so many people within the school. So that's hopefully going to help us out a lot. Who planned that? <laughs> awesome. Good marketing. Yeah. Marketing <laughs> department. And my other comment was just about um, the nonprofit and the family in need and helping them out. That's the coolest part. Aside from all the merchandise and the jewelry and stuff, that that's the best part. That's awesome. That's yeah, what excited. it's all about. Yep. I'm very, very proud excited. of you guys. Great mm -hmm. job. <laughs> all right. Um, next up, we have Kids Care website. Uh, Laura Sandness and Joanne Stevens. Good evening. We wait till. Mm. Sure. Doing really not going. We can never want to. So it's our best audience ever. I know. Good evening again. I have the great privilege this evening to introduce you three outstanding young ladies. We have fifth grader Sasha Gilbertson, fifth grader Bryn Danes, and sixth grader, former Evergreen Elementary student, Devin Reeves, that they took a challenge from their tag teacher last year, Mrs. Sadness, to develop a project learning based um, system. And what they did with it is amazing. They developed a website that you're going to hear about this evening that truly makes a difference for the greater Cooley region area. Um, it was advertised on Channel 8 last week and also is the cover of iEcho Magazine, which is Imagination, Every Child Has One. So with that, I want you to hear from the three girls. Hi, um, our project is Kids Care, which is an organization made by kids to help kids. So Seisha had the awesome idea to help children who are less fortunate th than we are and are in the hospital for long-term illnesses or ailments. Um, so our, our idea has been through many transformations. Our first desire was to sponsor one specific, one specific child who is in the hospital and make their day brighter. And then we met with Mrs. Wee to establish a website and share our idea. And then we sent our idea to contacts and will someone help us get started? And then we readjusted our, then we readjusted our idea after meeting with the professionals. Um, now we are, um, the 
the website is improving constantly, all the time. And recently, we visited the Children's Miracle Network um, and visited Heather Gillis, who is the program manager for the Children's Miracle Network. And we put the wish list from there on the website so that people can see it. And then we shared our idea on the radio through the Lacrosse Radio Group's Radiothon on November 2nd at 7 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then we wrote an article for IACO, which is a local magazine. And like Mrs. Stevens said, we are on the cover and we're the featured article in there. And actually, we received over $300 in monetary donations so far, and we haven't even started our toy drive yet. So that's exciting. Um, some upcoming events are, well, the IACO was released. So we're planning a toy drive at Evergreen, January 2nd through January 16th. And we're thinking about a toy drive at Holman Middle School around the same time. and. We are hoping to visit really soon to the Children's Miracle Network hospitals with the donations that we've collected. And the rest is on its way. <laughs> um, we are three students who really want to make a difference. I'm Bryn Danes. I'm Sasha Gilbertson. I'm Devin Reeves. And we want to give a special thanks to our parents for all their support in time and think to thank our teachers and our principals who encourage us to dream. These are some pictures from our events. The first one on the left is us at the um, hospital in the toy room, which is the room that we're promoting pretty much. And the second one is the Ayako photo shoot. So yeah. Um, so our website is www.evkidscare.weebly.com and so then you can visit there to just see our website <laughs> and then we have a corny joke. <laughs> <laughs> and then we want to thank you for letting us share our idea, and if anyone has any questions, they can tell us, ask us now. So if people wanted to contribute to your drive for, with toys or with uh, monetary donations, who would they contact or where would they drop off toys and say it loudly and give an address because there are a lot of people listening at home that might want to write it down. Thank you. Um, we have a donations bin at the Evergreen Elementary office. It's like right when you walk into the door, you'll see it. Or you can mail it to us at, um, for Evergreen, which is 510 Long Cooley Road. And you can make the, ch if you want to do a check, you can make it out to the School District of Holman, Attention Kids Care. you Just a couple of comments first off for those of you who are regular watchers I love when the the, the, the students come out to these uh, meetings I mean that's that's why I'm here as a board member it's really about the kids great job to you guys what composure what presentation skills fantastic so look at their thank faces you. yeah I, faces I know it's absolutely them. awesome and you can spread the word the board's not that scary so uh, you know we, we love it when people come out and visit us anytime so great job thanks for what you're doing to uh, really uh, um, make the school district of home in a great place thank you thank you do um, do all three of you have a parent or parents here tonight that you could introduce for us yeah <laughs> Go ahead and do that. Um, my mom and dad are here. You can wave. <laughs> oh, my mom is Tarina and my dad is Scott. Yeah. Um, my mom and st dad are here and it's, um, wave people. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, Tiffany Fawcett Miller and mm -hmm. Trevor Miller. Um, my mom is here. She's over there in the black coat. <laughs> She is Jolene Reeves. I just wanted a face um, that produced such wonderful children. And um, girls, you know that you are a product of these people, don't you? 
that you grew up to be who you are and such a caring person. It all started there at home. So thank you to these Holman citizens that gave <laughs> gave this whole school district such wonderful students. Appreciate that very much. Um, marvelous. And your teacher also. Um, thank you for all that support that you put into these three young women that had the confidence to just jump out and go, I can do that. I can do that. Those are good words, and I'm glad that you believe them. So thanks to all of you out there. And how old are you again? How old are each of you? I'm 11. Um, I'm 10. 11. That is incredible. I don't think most 10 and 11 year olds would be, I mean, maybe they would be. I'd like to think they could do that, but you you guys are, are incredible kids. Together they're 30-something. Really. Yes, you are. <laughs> 30, 32. <laughs> That's great. I'm very proud of you. Good Thank job. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay, and then next we have uh, instructional services, new course proposals. Uh, Wendy Svasky. <coughs> Well, good evening. On Thursday night, our curriculum council team were able to hear about these three course proposals. They overwhelmingly approved the course proposals, and that's why they are here for you today. And they're all world language proposals. So I will hand it over to our team, and I think they'll introduce. Brian, are you doing all the presenting? Yeah, so. And Brian Wolpat is going to be presenting this evening. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I'll introduce quickly my, my colleagues, Chris Kruger, who teaches Spanish at the high school, Jennifer Oliveres, who teaches Spanish at the high school, and Justine Horvath, who teaches French at the middle school. Um, tonight, we're here with three proposals for you. And just to kind of give you some background between about these proposals, um, when the school district proposed that we do PLCs, the World Language Department took it extremely seriously. Um, we worked 6, 12, and we decided we need to come together to, to establish the learning targets that we want between students in 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. In doing so, our journey took us to where we found out that the middle school curriculum is basically the same curriculum that is taught in level one at the high school. And this benefited us greatly because we could then turn around and say, students that are coming out of the middle school, going into the high school, we know exactly what they've covered as they move into level two. At the same time, we were able to sit there and say, okay, is it necessary that the students that are coming out of the middle school repeat that same curriculum? Because that had been the tradition previous to that. And so we, we worked very hard at creating a placement exam. So if students took the full sequence within the middle school, that they could take a placement test in eighth grade and place into level two as a freshman coming into the high school. Um, the first two years that we did this was very, very successful. We continue to do it today. Um, what has happened, though, is as we've gotten really specific with, with our students' needs, we found that within the middle school schedule that students have the option of not continuing after seventh grade. Um, as we developed these learning targets, we realized, okay, if they don't continue after seventh grade, that means they've covered half of the curriculum. So the consequence of that is that those students then start back over at level one in the high school. So we're basically saying, hypothetically, mm -hmm. that for nine weeks they've already learned the material that they're coming into with, at the high school. Because eighth grade is set up as an elective as well, and they can take one semester or two, those students that choose to just take one semester cover then 75% of the curriculum. Now again, we don't have anything to help them along so that when they come to the high school, they can continue into level two they have to start over at the beginning, level one, learning those targets again. <coughs> now this is not anything new where we haven't gone before to try to work with our counterparts at the middle school to say, okay, how is this, is there a way, a solution for us to correct this? What our job has been the last two years is to actually collect data. And so on the PowerPoint you can see we are right now currently in our self-study. And so one of the questions that we asked to stakeholders in the community is, 
learning French or Spanish in the middle school? Should it be equal to one year of high school French or Spanish instruction? And 41.9% and of the respondents agreed. Now when you compare it to those who disagreed, it's, it's a pretty big number. Um, unfortunately, we have those that had no opinion, but it's hard for us to determine what does that mean? Is it that they just don't understand the schedule at the middle school, they don't understand it at the high school, they don't understand what it means for placement? Um, so it's really hard, but 41.9% agreeing really gives us a little bit of leverage to say, I think this is important, it's time to do this, but we can continue to collect data. We know that the ideal situation is, is for the middle school mm -hmm. to be able to cover this instructional time and sequence all on their own. Um, we, we've gone over and we've talked to Mr. Vogler about it. We've talked to previous administrations. So that's one aspect of it. That would be the actual ideal situation. The other side of it is to say, can we create classes at the high school to fill basically the gap that exists? And so these are level 1A and 1B. Level 1A is designed for incoming students who have completed 50% of the level 1 curriculum in the middle school. So it's one semester of language study that they have had beyond sixth grade. Um, we would offer it for one term, 90 minutes, half a credit, given that it's only half the class. 1B then is for students who have completed 75% of the curriculum at the middle school, so it's two semesters. So then it's, a, it's half of basically 1A. So it's one term, 45 minutes, mm -hmm. half the credit. If you're a visual learner, this is kind of what it looks like within our learning targets. We've been very proud at the fact that we've, we've, we've worked hard at establishing exactly what we want our students to learn. And so you can see where within the middle school curriculum, if they take it in seventh grade and then bump out, what is remaining? Now if they continue on into eighth grade, they get a half of that amount more, and, but th there's still just that little gap. And currently, we are asking those students that have taken it for either half or three-fourths to start over. Part of this journey, we're not naive to the fact that, I mean, there's so many facets involved to make this work. Um, we understand that the, the schedule at the middle school, it, it's, it's kind of a, a monster on its own to make it all work. Um, the, the schedule at the high school, we, we went to the scheduling people and, and said, how is this gonna fit? because we currently teach on a 90 minute block. Our classes are 90 minute for two semesters. We're not proposing a 90 minute block. Um, we're proposing a class that could run, could not run. And we're very cognizant of that because we're, we're gonna respect the fact that there is a class limit that needs to be there for them to offer the class. But then you get into these what if situations of, well what if it's only a class that's one semester for 45 minutes, or one term, sorry, for 45 minutes what do we do for the rest of that time? And is that fair that our other counterparts are, are teaching the full period? Um, it, it all brings us back to, is there any way that we can work with the middle school to get this curriculum established at the middle school? <coughs> we currently have the system in place to do that. Um, and so part of this proposal is, is really to come to you to say, this is the gap. We're very cognizant of, of, of what we want to do to meet our students' needs, to move them on into level two. Um, we struggle as a department knowing that we're doubling our efforts by doing this. Because these classes A are already offered at the middle school. We're, we're, we have employees that, that teach this exact material. Um, and, and in terms of scheduling, there could be possibilities where we're not teaching that full block. And we realize that that's not fair, and, but it's what we are just trying to do to meet our students' needs. Any questions on the 1A, 1B? So and I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So in the middle school, the sixth grade is exploratory foreign language. Seventh and eighth grade is elective. They can take partial, they can, they can take a little bit of it or a lot of it in seventh and eighth grade, but not enough to make up to a level one <coughs> competency. Well, they could, but, but if they don't, when they enter high school, whether they've taken a quarter of it or three quarters of it, they're all in the same class. So you have all these different levels. So you're suggesting offering different levels of classes to the incoming freshmen rather than lump them all together and okay yep. I just wanted to make sure I had that clear and that makes total sense to me I have a question too um, 
Besides world languages, middle school students have opportunities to take other classes for high school credit, right? And I'm not sure what they all are. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm guessing like a mathematics, there are certain middle school students who, if they and their parents decide want to take a high school level class, they can take that class? Oh, I believe so. <sighs> I think there is a math or class. Or somebody math else class. here know that? What, uh, what Ms. I'm going Vasky or Mr. Vogler? Yeah. Please, thank you. And I guess as you're coming up, the reason I'm asking is I'm just wondering, I'm wondering about the dropping out option. I, I know world languages has often had a status different than math. I'm sorry that it does. <laughs> I wish it, I wish it had that same status. So I'm just wondering what other courses in middle school can a middle school child take and then exit with certain credits for high school. And the second follow-up question with that is, is, when they take those courses, do they have a dropout option? Is it elective? Well, it's, I guess it's, is what I'm going after. I guess it's, um, it's 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 not apples to apples. Okay. I, I would say. Help me understand Student, that, Students man. that are on an accelerated math track um, have have met certain qualifications that help us to say we think that this would be the best opportunity for you to meet your level to meet your needs in this math class, and so if they are on that more accelerated math track, then when they would get to high school, at that point is when they would be taking, they would be beginning at a higher level in math. Um, with foreign language, what they can do right now at the middle school is that if they do take one semester in their seventh grade year, and then they choose to take a sem both semesters in their eighth grade year, at that point is when they have the opportunity to take the placement test. And if they pass that placement test, then at that point is when they would be going to the high school and they would start at that level two. Mm -hmm. And so if they are in, um, for example, if in the middle school when they're choosing their electives, um, we do our best to tell our students that we want you to, when you choose these electives, have a conversation with your family, and we don't want you the following year to be halfway through the year and then say, I want to drop out of this. Part of the reason for that is we want them to have that conversation with their parents in advance, mm -hmm. but then when that year is going on, there are times when we do make exceptions, when things just aren't working in a student's schedule. And that's when we do try and make changes, but that's very seldom that we do that. And in neither one of those cases are they getting high school credits, right? Is what you're saying? When they drop out, they're not. No, they're they're or what? getting high school credit. Yes. I don't know that that when they go, they get. That would be something that I would have to look into. I just believe that what is happening is they they start at a higher level so then it gives them that opportunity to go further um, at in high school which then would allow them to to possibly do do more things thank you can you repeat again when they can take the placement exam was it after the eighth at the end of their eighth grade year yep. if if they take and correct me if i'm wrong they can take that placement test if they take seventh grade and both semesters in eighth grade we have learned through through talking with guidance is that if we would put, let's say we put into place um, a, a schedule within the middle school where sixth grade is exploratory, and then when they elect in seventh grade to sign up for French, Spanish, or both, or neither one, that let's say that we, we did a system where it was one semester seventh grade, then it automatically rolled into eighth grade and they would take it for the entire year. When they come into the high school, we can turn around, provide a student list of those kids that have completed the eighth grade year and they can earn credit for the class in that they took in middle school they c that's they can that's in place now or that's something we don't you'd like have to it in look place, at but, but we've talked about it because lacrosse has a system where the kids have to take level two to get retroactive credits for one and and in fact 
um, we can do it where they don't even have to take level two. We can give them the credit for level one. I, I was just, I was also just going to ask what are other local, not, not that not necessarily is always the bottom line reasoning, but I wondered what other precedents there are for middle schools in our county or across the state. Do you know how this is done in, in areas? Well, and that's part of where this, this discussion for this year when we're doing our self-study really came from because we got to visit Stevens Point Senior High School and Wisconsin Rapids, and both of them have middle school programs that lead into the high school. Um, Stevens Point has two levels that the kids can actually accomplish before they get into the high school. So then we did do the comparisons around here, and out of Toma, Onalaska, La Crosse, and Onalaska, they all offer a program where the kids can place into level two. They get one full year in um, mm -hmm. high school, West Salem included, and then it's us in Sparta that do the, if you've taken so much of it, you start back over in level one. Oh, if they take no language at all in the, in, in the middle school and decide they want to start in high school, what, where, do they, where are they placed? Then their option is level one. Yep, they start right at the beginning. Does, does the, the request for three additional high school classes, and, I, and I've read, I've done my homework, I've read what was in my board packet and tried to wrap my head around it. Does that, <laughs> does that um, impact us? Because when I see that, is there a cost to this? And, and I know on one of the documents or many of the documents it had zero, but then it was like, well, pending paying of a teacher, does that, does that impact our budget? And where I'm going with this is, if something could be done at the middle school or a trial year or something, would that be less expensive than adding three? Well, I should just say two. I'm, I'm going ahead with the honors course that you're asking for too. I just, I'm just asking a money question, I guess. It would. It um, would. Because we currently have both the Spanish and French teacher in place. The courses are available. Um, it just is a matter of, of scheduling which we've, we've, we've conversed with Mr. Vogler about. It's, it's, when it comes down to the other applieds, then it's a question of equity. Um, and, and it's interesting because at Curriculum Council, uh, one of the members mentioned, you know, I kind of feel that world language is a different ball of wax. Most classes you can go so far, and if you go to the university, you just keep going. And world language is literally one where we, and you'll hear this again with the honors, is level one, be it at the middle school, at the high school, or at the university, is the same. You all start with greetings and numbers and the alphabet. Um, and so we look at this as we're duplicating the efforts at the high school that in, in something that we can already offer at the middle school. It really just comes down to taking the bull by the horns and, and saying, okay, we, we can. We can trial this for one or two years and see how this works in terms of, of getting, giving kids that option of completing level one. <coughs> so to clarify, you would not <coughs> not anticipate any increase in staffing as a result of these class no, ads. I would say instead of having you have yep. 10, 10 kids yep, I just going to level one at the high school, now you're going to have five going to level one and five going yep. to level two. Yeah, so it's all the same. It's not yeah, going to be more kids. Yeah. It's not going to be more. Our main concern people. comes from in a block, is it fair that we would only teach, say, 45 minutes out of that block? And then what does, what does our administration do with us for that other 45 minutes? because it, it's a possibility in this situation. And I know my thoughts there, but and so to block scheduling. <laughs> but it's a, it's a matter of, <laughs> we have to be troubleshooters in this situation and say, is there a way to, pr to prevent this from happening? And we do, we have some resources available. I think it's great to allow students to progress as, as they excel and, and to put them where they should be in their educational path, whether it's math or language science whatever the case but can you clarify again if they would get actual credit because at first we said no and then we, and then I think I heard you say yes no it, yes we 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 what we did is we High proposed to say can we can we kind of duplicate the lacrosse model because they currently allow their students to get retro credit and the conversation was per DPI rules you're not supposed to have a requirement attachment to it. The fact is that they've done the seat time, they've done the coursework, they've earned the credit. It doesn't count for GPA, but it can count on their transcript as a, as a credit. Is that would be the only thing that would concern me is that we have um, students that would be in advanced math classes, 
or other types of advanced classes that are skipping a year of math, going into a higher level of math in eighth grade, and then they get into a higher level when they start as a freshman in high school, and they didn't get credit for taking that or skipping that other level of math. So that would be my only concern, is that we're equitable in terms of the credit issue. I know that it, it ultimately it's their education and they're advancing and it's, it's going to take them farther in college and those kinds of things, but. So, so let's say uh, we had a student who wanted to take Spanish in her sixth, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, and then skipped all high school, where would she be placed in college? Level one, I'm sure. Four years, the absence of foreign language, you don't practice it and use it, you lose and that it. That would be the same like in math. If oh, well, and the other part is that when, when our students um, leave and if they go to the UW school system, they take a placement exam. So, I mean, there is a possibility that if they're excelled, they could place into level one at the university. But it's the university runs the same system of placement. If they place in a higher level, they earn the retroactive credits if they earn a B plus or better. Um, <clears throat> trying to figure out how to ask this. Is it um, this evening? Is this something we would decide on? Because what I'm also, what I'd be kind of curious about is what if you proposed a couple of different things? And what if you came back to us next yeah. time or in January? This is because just, I'm, oh, go ahead. No, this is, this in, is for information tonight and then <clears throat> hopefully next week, next on the 17th, correct? Am I correct? Correct. We're going to be voting. All right. Um, so we have a week. Because I'd be interested in what, when you mentioned all those districts around us that have a different approach, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not saying it's better, but I, I'd like to weigh them side by side. And I don't know if I know enough about that other model that I'm hearing where a middle school child could opt to receive credit down the pipe. That doesn't seem bad to me either, but I just don't. I'm just going to just, if I could interject, I may yeah. ask Ms. Savasky to assist me on this. Again, what's before you is a recommendation for approval of courses at the high school. Um, and if, if uh, maybe further clarification, this is not talking about credit earned at the middle school. And so this is specific to courses that have gone through our process beginning at the high school and uh, high school administration has approved, signed off, and then it has moved on to curriculum council and that has um, been passed and approved and the next step is to come here for approval. The part of the timing, this is the time of the year when we always put any request for new courses uh, because we're anxiously uh, needing to then get to the next step of um, student registration, which uh, we need to print the catalog and so on. So this is, the, this is the normal time of going through any approval for new courses where a number of people have been working on this. And, um, but I, I believe we're, again, we're talking about the courses specific for the high school. And I think uh, what I've uh, taken is conversation that is possibly impacting the middle school which is I don't believe is part of this proposal so could I just follow up with a question of what you just said Absolutely. though but if things were different at the middle school for example if a child could earn that credit down there my support of new courses would be different <laughs> so if I knew that my middle school kids could if they wanted to opt into and and finish and buy and buy into yes I will finish this you see what I'm going with this it, I mean it kind of depends so help me with Kate they help are, me with, yeah. my, with the things I'm they weighing. can already do that through electives say that again they I'm can sorry. already do that through electives it's yes, all about I the choices that, that they, but they make. drop out and there's the problem right and that's why we need these courses because we have 50% kids that have finished 50%, 75% have to start over right. without these courses. And we're trying to address that problem. I get that. Yeah. And but I'm just wondering about other options. That's all. Right. And we did, 
you know, discuss, and I know Dr. Carlson and I spoke very quickly this morning, would it be an opportunity to offer a summer school course that they could get the pieces that they're missing so they can enter high school at that level too, you know? So that is something we're also investigating to help kids be at level two, so. And I'm hoping there's not a misunderstanding about credit. They get credit for what they've accumulated at high school, but they do. it does not go toward high school credit, the 26 credits to graduate. So I just want to make that part clear so that's not muddy. Can you say that again? That's what I was just idea. thinking. What did you just say? Can you, can you repeat that? They get credit for taking the year one at the middle school, but that doesn't go towards the 26 credits towards graduation. They get credits so they can start in level two, but they don't get a credit on their transcript. They don't get high school credit. Yeah, right. that's just middle right. school. Right, that's the same way our math courses work. They can take algebra and geometry in the middle school, middle but they school. don't get high school credit. Right. In school. But when he, was, when he was talking about lacrosse receiving credit going back for that first year. That is not something that we even discussed at Curriculum Council, so. I wouldn't see that as being an advantage either. It, then you end up with a bunch of high school seniors that will graduate in December. What does that buy you? Again, that, right, that hasn't been discussed through the process, so we would not be prepared tonight or to make that part of this proposal. Thank you. I it is something clear. eventually I'd like to hear more about, though, because well, yeah, I think so as we advance and advance, and if we have several children in middle school that are capable of doing that, I mean, mm -hmm. we do have that. Why, why can we not look at that as, as education evolves? Um, and yes, some may stop in December senior year, but there may be many, many more who take more credits, you know, or, or can take college credits then because they have other credits. So it's just a question that I have out there. And it seemed, and it's just another option that personally, I don't feel like I know enough about, and I, I wasn't even sure how many districts are offering that. But I'm, we've often talked about our, competition is maybe the wrong word, but our leveling ourselves with, with districts that are compatible with us. And if there are advantages for middle school students in other districts that we aren't offering, I kind of want to know why, or I kind of want to learn just about it and see, like, why, why couldn't we do that? I don't want to keep going all night on this, but I do have a lot of questions about that. Okay. Well, because it hasn't been mentioned in the, in the Curriculum Council when it was discussed recently, I don't want to see it never discussed. I'd love to hear more about it. I mean, I think the board would like to hear more about it. If I'm speaking for myself, but I can't see any reason not to hear more about it. Well, I'm, I'm really speaking for myself in terms of how I would vote on this. And I guess I want, I want to say that, that I want some more information to make sure that I'm voting for my middle school kids and, and what best opportunities I can give them. That's what I want to give them. And I, I don't think right now I can. But we're really voting for the high school children as well because we want them to be put into a class where they're excelling and they're in the right place for the learning. We don't want them to repeat. No, I, I agree with that. Of a language yeah. they've already done. So I. I would argue that we're not necessarily voting for middle school, we're voting for that high school student that doesn't have to repeat that year or semester of language and can excel even further. And, and I'm not saying I can't vote on this next week with the information we have currently, but as time goes on, I'd love to hear more about the middle school the credit component and, of it also. But anyhow, any other questions or comments? Anything else? <coughs> All right. Thank you so much. Should I just the other one? And you have more. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll, I'll make this really <laughs> quick. Okay. Um, part of the other, the, I mean, this is, we looked at one spectrum and then we looked at the other spectrum, which is uh, how are we meeting our students in terms of, with, within the whole RTI, we've got students that basically are your average students. You have those that, that 
that struggle at times and we can work with them and what about the students that are just gifted in language what are we doing with them right now um, and so we asked within our self-study is it important to propose an accelerated course um, and 68.4 percent of the respondents agreed and so we, we, we had this little bit of a vision, and it's, it's long term down the road. And this, this graphic is crazy, um, but basically there's a, there's a couple of paths that we're trying to do here. Um, and this is a four year plan. This is not something that we're, we're looking to implement all of it right away, but for next year is to look at a, an honors level two. It's the same curriculum, the same learning targets, but because of the, the learners themselves, um, they're, they're just quicker at learning the material. It's, the idea is that it, it frees up enough time to get deeper into it than for what we can't currently do. Um, again, Onalaska has a model where they have a, a, a basically mm -hmm. level one, level two, level three, level four, and then they have an AP course levels for the for their other students. What we, we're trying to do with this crazy graphic is to show that we're not closing the doors to students at any level whatsoever. That in, in the, the topic of summer school was brought up, and so we, we went and we talked to Mrs. Lindquist about is this a possibility and and it all comes down to funding um, and student interest but basically that if a student is is not really completely prepared to go into the honors course but says you know what this is something that I want to challenge myself with that we can offer them that that summer school option to to say okay come in we'll do kind of a booster course get you up to speed and then you can move into the honors course again it's a matter of they can move back into the the normal level three but you also could have a student that goes level one level two level three and then says you know i actually want to challenge myself with level four honors and so we need to again give them that booster class during the summer to say all right if you do the coursework that's required to kind of bring you up to speed to where we're at and and so you feel more confident about what you're going to be learning and doing then that's there and that's an option for you that was much quicker than the other one. <laughs> and I just want to say I've talked to a couple of students who are in French right now um, who have talked to me about um, the exact same things you're saying as the summer school course and um, also having another um, honors class. And they're really excited about it. Kids want this to happen because they want to be able to advance their ling world language skills. It's just something that many students want to do and get involved with so this is something that students are very excited about anything else merci beaucoup gracias <laughs> uh, questions? thank you so much oh, thank you moving on Business office, second quarter budget, budget adjustments. Jason Austin. Well, I feel like I'm the dead weight on the end of the informational agenda here. <laughs> After those exciting more informational topics here I show up with a bunch of numbers so okay just gotta get to the document everyone's all been waiting for here I do tell you I'm pretty impressed with that group of three earlier tonight because I have a fourth grader and um, she's pretty sharp, but those girls were really sharp. So it's just just amazing to see um, the kids and what they can do and when, when they're pushed a little bit. So, well, tonight I'm going to present the first of first set of the 2012-13 budget revisions. Um, later on, I'm going to be asking for approval of these same revisions, in addition to approval on the budget variables. So this is the point in time during the year. When I'm jumping back and forth, I'm doing two budget years at the same time. So right now, I feel like I eat, sleep, and breathe budgets at this point, operating in two different fiscal periods, trying to keep it all straight, trying to keep the current, and try to keep the projections into next year straight. So with that, uh, the revised budgets uh, that I present to you tonight, um, this is a culmination. It starts back in December 2011 when we start the budget process. We present the preliminary budget, of course, in April, the proposed budget in August, the original budget in October, and here we are tonight presenting the first set of the revisions. We'll have more revisions come in March and, again, possibly in June as well. 
So we're trying to get on a quarterly cycle where we present them in December, March, and June. So with these budget revisions that I provided to you tonight, I'd first like to start off and just make a quick note. Um, in this format, of course, there's column A, which is it summarizes the different um, descriptions in each account, um, sources and expenditures. Column B focuses on the audited annual 2011 information, C, the original budget, the revisions in column D, and then in column E, the revised budget, the ending budget that I'm looking for approval on tonight. What I would like to mention is in column B, there are two or three minor adjustments in column B, and this doesn't really require a revision, but I made a footnote on the bottom of the document just so you know why these certain cells are highlighted in yellow. So for instance, on the revenue side, on line 52, column B, there was a 25 cent change in the revenue from the audited or from the report I presented during October to the audited number. So I had needed to make that adjustment just so the numbers all work out and I can reconcile with my annual report that DPI has. So very, very minor change there. Scrolling a little bit further down in column C, line 101, the indebtedness end of year number, that originally was $29,000 higher and that was because all of the payment was applied to interest, not principal. Principal knocked that down further by 29,000, which was not reflected on the bud original bu budget report, excuse me. And last but not least, line item 109, uh, fun food service revenue. There was one minor change there in the October budget. It showed the anticipated uh, ending result for revenue, not the actual. So I just wanted to make those three changes which really don't impact anything except <coughs> beginning balances in 12-13 or ending balances in 12-13. So now onto the budget revisions themselves. Very, very few bu budget revisions that I'd like to present to you tonight. One, on the revenue side, line item 32, column C of $20,012. This is an adjustment that was required to be made because our third Friday account numbers were adjusted downward a little bit in November. As a result, we, we set our tax levy based on those higher numbers. So come June, they're going to adjust that off of our equalized aid. So we need to reduce our equalized aid by that amount that we over levied in October. So it all washes out in the end. So making a minor adjustment there because that's a known factor on the revenue side. I'm not ready to make any other revenue changes at this point in time, except in food service. If I may jump down to food service line 109 of $33,000. It was determined early on, um, Mike Gasper and I, Mr. Gasper and I, looked at the federal aid reimbursements for lunches and breakfasts, and that amount was revised. The amount per meal was revised upward, and so, we are increasing the revenue at this point in time by $33,000 to reflect those anticipated increased revenues in meal reimbursements. So nothing more on the revenue side. On the expenditure side, and we go to this category 58, line 58 and below. Um, some minor revisions here on the expenditure side. Some of those re revisions result in a realignment of the programs. Um, a shifting of some expenses from Fund 27 into Fund 10, um, done by Pupil Services, um, some increase in expenditure accounts from carryover, finalized carryover amounts um, from some of the program budgets, um, one-time adjustments, um, and that's about it on the expenditure side, nothing too significant. The most significant area is Line 70, Business Administration and there's just some minor adjustments there um, stemming mostly from some one-time expenditures on the um, custodial maintenance side and some of the projects that we didn't originally budget on the expenditure side 
what we budgeted for on the revenue side. So we're just catching up some of those expenditures um, at this point in time. Nothing else that I'd like to bring to your attention, but looking for approval on these. If Does anybody have any questions at this point in time? I would like to just mention that with the fund balance, because we're seeing a decrease of $20,000 in revenue at this point in time and an increase of approximately $94,000 in expenditures at this point in time, we're looking at a, a, a shift into the fund balance at this point. We're looking at an operational surplus or deficit of a negative 21000 at this point. No change to the structural side. Remember that structural side is the sinking fund. We're not planning on spending any more there. We're not planning on generating any more in that. But it comes merely an adjustment on the operational surplus or deficit side. So right now we're looking at dipping into that a little bit with all things being equal, unless nothing else changes at your end. So, Anybody have any questions on that? Doesn't look like it. No. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The dead weight did pretty well. He did pretty <laughs> well. Thank all you. Right. It was very exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> I figured you'd like that, Mr. Dunlap. <laughs> Employee handbook floating holiday revision. It's like Kate's. <laughs> Hello. Okay, so as we are continuing to progress through the year and um, implement the language that we have in our employee handbook, um, we continue to see what's working and what needs improvement within the language. And um, floating holidays has one that has been brought to our attention and needs some revisions. So um, initially when the language was drafted, we intentionally made the change to remove the holiday reference on that um, Good Friday, Easter Monday holiday for our staff members. Um, at this time, while we didn't specifically clarify it in the language, it wasn't meant to change when that holiday would be used by staff. However, it would allow us the flexibility if we needed it, let's say as a snow day, or if we have a board meeting on the Monday after Easter that normally is a holiday, but we need to have some flexibility for staff. Um, so while we didn't initially put that intention in the language, we're realizing now that we need to have some more clarification within the language so we don't have employees using floating holidays before they should be intentionally used. Um, we're finding that someone may use a floating holiday um, during a contracted day, which therefore ultimately reduces their 186 days to 185. So there's some behind the scenes payroll things that come up um, without this additional clarification language um, that has been drafted. So um, the language that you see in the packet tonight would be what we're seeking approval for next Monday to implement immediately within the employee handbook. So are there any questions on that language? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next, transportation van replacement. I don't see John Daly, but I see Roger Saxton. I want to thank the other previous presenters for toning things down before I came I've been talking to you about a grant that we're applying for. We did advertise both for bus bids and for van bids. Uh, earlier this month, uh, we did receive bus bids, and uh, I'll be coming back to you at the next meeting, uh, hopefully with a recommendation on that. Tonight, uh, because the van bids that we asked for, we did not receive any that were acceptable for the type of equipment that we wanted. Uh, so at that point, we rejected uh, the one bid that we did receive and I went out and started looking for used vehicles on my own. And so uh, tonight I'm bringing forward uh, a request to purchase a van uh, that does meet our specifications. And I included some information that gives you a rough idea of some of the things that I look at uh, as I decide which vehicle to purchase. 
So uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We are looking at a eight passenger van, uh, which is different than we have had before. They've always been seven passenger vans. We're hoping that little bit of flexibility will in some cases reduce uh, the number of vehicles that we send on trips. Uh, it also provides more room uh, for our three and four year olds that use our vans because this particular uh, brand of van is wider than the other vehicles. And if you've ever moved child seats in and out of vans, uh, you know how those hands get pinched. So. So again, we are we have included this on the consent agenda this evening, uh, but for the <coughs> timeliness issue. And uh, Mr. Saxton, I know, has thoroughly researched this, and um, so we will be asking for your approval as part of the consent agenda. Okay, next is board member report and discussion. I'll call upon board members in the order of roll call and ask that you present any comments or committee reports you have. Um, first would be Joe Gittins. No comments. No comments, all right. Um, Kate Mayer. Um, no, SALC has not met since the last board meeting and I reported then, so we're all good to go. There is one item we'll talk about today with the, the veterans and their high school oh, diplomacy. That's but right. That's pretty much, and you want to talk about that. I have some exciting You have to, you have to wait your turn. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Um, okay, Tim Mettinger. Uh, just a couple of things again earlier. Absolutely fantastic to see the, the two different groups uh, to start us off today. Always fun when the students do come to the board meetings. Always a particular highlight for me and uh, really continues to remind me why I'm here so always very nice to see that and then I notice uh, Mr. Vogler out there looking a little short on the hair as we approach winter but uh, very nice and uh, thanks to you and your dedication as well out there also so um, and that's all I have this evening all right thank you um Kari Treadway just want to remind those out there that are interested in running for school board the candidacy forms are available and you have until January 2nd at I believe mm -hmm. to get those in so please consider serving and where do they turn them into I'm sorry. school board office okay thank you uh, Brianna Schwabenbauer <laughs> well actually tonight first I would like to start off by um, um, throughout my service on the school board I'm sorry, I'm kind of an emotional person, but, um, okay. I am too, if that makes you feel better. I realize that there have been some times where I have maybe overstepped my boundaries or where I have maybe offended people or disrespected people in some way and I wanted to apologize for that um, and I would ask that um, if you ever do feel like I am overstepping my boundaries in some way to let me know because I I have a great respect for this district but I don't want to I don't want to, I don't know how to put this. I don't want to act out of my position. I want to be able to um, serve you or, or serve the student body, but at the same time not um, overstep my boundaries um, and um, be inappropriately involved or engaged. Um, so I just wanted to start off with that apology, but um, next, I had some exciting news for Mrs. Mayor. <laughs> um, okay, I had, um, uh, I was in the guidance counselor's office and a veteran came in and he wants to receive his high school diploma. Oh, God. 
<laughs> and you were there. Uh -huh. That's amazing. And I was able to say, I know the board policy on that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that was exciting. So um, we're thinking about possibly. Um, uh, we haven't. I haven't really talked too much about this, but uh, the guidance counselors want to put together a little ceremony for them at the actual graduation <gasps> service. So I think that'd be neat um, if we could. I do too. Um, have him um, come up on stage and receive his diploma. When's the last time that's happened in this district where we've had a veteran? Like 15 years ago? 15 it was years a ago? long, long time ago. I remember. Yeah? I remember. You don't long, remember it, huh? Long time ago. It might be nice to invite that veteran to a board meeting as well. That would be good. Yeah. Oh, lucky. Lucky you to have Very exciting. Scott, that's neat. Yes. <laughs> Um, and also in other reports, just with the board member outreach, um, uh, I know there's been some concern about the December 18th date. So I was thinking about talking to a Dr. Tronsted and having that move to January, sometime in January, um, after the holidays when less people, it's not so busy. Um, and then I also um, reached out to students and staff over the past two weeks to talk to them about the budget variables that we had discussed um, and I just wanted to give you their input about the um, some of the uh, budget variables that were being talked about um, and students and staff that they had a concurring opinion that um, they believe that um, staff sizes should be um, able to increase um, and I know I talked to Dr. Carlson about this and he said that's um, that we have the um, second the amended budget area variable input um, item in there um, that uh, has the language of a staff increase um, but I just wanted to let you know that um, students and staff basically stated the same concerns that we had talked about common core standards um, there's also a science requirement um, at a um, state science science class requirement um, coming down the line so their main uh, concern is that class sizes will be affected um, because of this and then I asked them to come up with budget variables of their own that they could consider and many of them said um, activities co-curricular activities could be somewhere that we could look at um, student transportation um, closer travel to sporting events and even cuts or balances across all um, budget items yep so that is all that I have for you today thank you all right thank you uh, mr. Dunlap I just wanted to uh, ask everybody to go shop at uh, Polar Express if they get some time and buy some things for Christmas yes I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and I want everybody to drive carefully and be safe over the holidays we hate to have any bad news over the holiday break that's all I have okay, thank you um, I guess I just wanted to say, I, I know it's, I'm probably not politically correct, and, and I'll say happy holidays because no matter which holiday you celebrate, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, I celebrate Christmas, so I just say Merry Christmas, but no matter which one you celebrate, I hope it's great, I hope you're with the people that you love, and I hope that underneath everything, all the trappings don't matter, it doesn't matter what you're eating, what you're opening and unwrapping, it just matters that you're with people that you care about and that the, the best feeling you can have and the best present you can have is that you're doing something really great for somebody that you love or maybe somebody that you don't even know that you're gonna pay something forward that you can never get paid back because that's a great feeling. <coughs> so I guess that's one suggestion I would make to anybody watching or listening to me. And if you're still listening, boy, what a die hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pay it forward, that's what, that's what it's all about at the holiday season, so. Find somebody that can never repay you for something and do something for them. So that's all I have, and I will move along because I'm. I have a lot of pressure on me from these other <laughs> <laughs> these other five people to keep it going. So um, let's see. Uh, we have. Um, you have correspondence received in the board folder. We've talked about committee reports, the board meeting schedule. We have um, next Monday, we have a meeting on the 17th. We have another meeting scheduled for January 14th. Um, the WASB convention is January 22nd through the 25th. 
um, in Milwaukee. So if anybody is planning to attend that, please make sure that you have talked to Christina and that you are registered. We also have a board meeting January 28th and February 11th. Um, Kari has talked about the school board election notice and then the school board administrative rules discussion and review, um, the smoke free environment policy, the suggestions and concerns and complaints, administrative rule and state tournament clinic attendance. Um, if you have any questions about those, those were discussed at the last um, personnel and governance no, they will be discussed. I'm sorry, I was, I was sick at the last personnel and governance committee meeting, so those I thought were discussed, but they were, were not. They are going to be discussed at the next committee meeting. And if you have any questions about those or comments, this would be the time or look them over and contact Cheryl or me or Dale or Jay. Um, we are all on the committee and let us know if you have any concerns about those. Um, next, we have the consent agenda items. Um, we will, let's see, we've all had background material on all of the agenda items. Um, if you have any agenda items you would like to consider separately, um, let me know. Otherwise, we will be approving all of these as a whole. Anyone? I, I would like to pull out 9.4 budget development event input variables. 9.4 input variables. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so we will pull out 9.4 input variables. <coughs> All right, so I would entertain a motion to approve the remaining consent agenda items, the 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, 9.5, 9.6, .9 and 9.8 as published. So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. All right, there's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion has passed. Okay, and 9.4. I, I will make a motion to approve 9.4A with scenario A only. Scenario A, let's find the description of scenario. That would be remaining staff at current levels. A second. Would that be something that we would seriously consider though? Would we? The, I, I think the concern, you know, we see in the paper again last week things as um, um, band instruments, um, we see the facilities on the committee, the things that we're starting to fall behind on from a facilities and an infrastructure standpoint. And the fact of the matter is, is right now as a school district, we have one of the highest percentages of our total budget going to salaries and benefits higher than, than other school districts. We also have one of the lowest teacher to pupil ratios. And if we want to be able to empower our, our administrators to manage their budget, you know, we talk about site-based budgeting, but then as a board, we don't give them enough money to do anything with. We talk about the issues with our technology being behind and all of those things as a district. And when we look at right now, our cost for salaries and benefits is at 82% of our budget, extremely high compared to other districts. And it's put us at a disadvantage when it comes to infrastructure expenditures, maintenance expenditures, and just continuing to provide our children with the good things that they need because we're out of whack on some other variables. And I think that there could be some efficiencies um, made and or potentially looking at some insurance changes or something to get that number back. But if we continue to not address that as a board, we're gonna continue our handcuff ourselves as we go forward. So I think the challenge would be, and this is just a budget to administration to see, can you do that? Can you continue to meet student learning? Can we continue to provide the great quality of education and not do that? Administration may come back and say we can't, but I think the challenge would be to administration is to say, try and do this with your budget. How are staff and teacher ratio determined in the district? Do we include all staff? 
and divide that by the total number of students. How reflective of that it, reflective is that the twelve to one of an actual classroom size? Mm -hmm. And as Ms. Cates makes her way over, uh, the staffing and perhaps Mr. Clark too, but either one can assist the staffing ratio that uh, again it includes all employees for example in uh, in not just our even instructional areas uh, we have a ratio based on that we also have ratios that break down all the way to the regular instructional classroom so it depends on what uh, what you may be asking as far as what that specific ratio would be um, on any, any Keep group track of a couple different ratios and some are specifically it's how DPI codes um, the staff as we report them in our annual 1202 report so there's a code 53 which includes um, classroom teachers elementary at all grade levels um, it may not include like nurses or psychologists those types so we do keep track of a couple different ratios those 53 coded teachers and all of our staff are all teachers so there's a couple different sets of numbers um, that we keep the pupil to teacher ratios and look at those different numbers so I think Jay's trying to find the exact data for us thank you do you think there'd be any possibility that we could reword the phrasing to um, staff um, Levels remain the same, excluding core teachers. Well, do we, we don't have to choose one or the other scenario tonight. This isn't that's the motion either, before the table. Your, right, the motion before us correct, now is correct. to choose one or the other. We don't have that's to. That's your motion, but we the, don't have to. That is what correct. was presented tonight is two scenarios that, that is could correct. vote on both mm -hmm. together. Yes. But I think it behooves us to give administration some direction as a board. Which <coughs> we've You've been hearing me for a long time now saying that we have growing expenditures. We have we, our, our resources and income is, re, is being reduced every year. There's going to have to be some adjustments made. If we make it across the board, then this is just going to have to be part of across the board that we're talking about, I think. <coughs> Any other option with the enrollment growth projection? Um, do we have any educated guess right now where that growth would be at? Elementary versus, I'm assuming that. We, we, I'm sorry, we do, but I don't have that available to me right now unless we have something, <clears throat> we have the projected levels, but I don't have that available with me right here. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Austin to step up because they did that cohort cohort analysis where they advance kids forward two grades. Maybe he can. Yeah, I can look to see if I have that information. I know that um, one of the areas, the twelfth grade, currently that we have. Is, is a smaller 12th grade. So that is being dropped off next year in the, in the two-year cohort analysis. So naturally then, if that's included this year, just a smaller class size, size leaving next year is going to create a, a, a larger um, overall student population if we maintain the status quo at the elementary school. And right now it's looking like we're going to continue to do that if we you know advance each grade forward and we use that same methodology that um, we used last year in our planning for the th through the five-year uh, PMA model anyways so I think there's a little bit of growth at the elementary school and just all grades just advancing forward and that 12th grade class leaving I think is is where much of that growth is gonna be driven but I don't know if I have that document in front of me tonight, but I can definitely get that information to you if you'd like okay. more specifics. Philosophical, educated guess. Thank yeah. you. I think we all realize that the perfect scenario would be, um, well, a perfect scenario would be one teacher for one student. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> um, 10 to 1, well, that would be, be much better, you know, 15 to 1. But as a school board, we're, uh, we're, we're commissioned to give the best education for the money that, for the money that's allocated to us, and I just think we're a little high right now with the, with the um, payroll. I think it needs to be at least maintained at an equal level. I don't think it should be advanced any further, at least this year, maybe next year. But do you think the well, education level of, of those teach, te teachers has any, anything to do with that? Are you, if you hired hypothetically all entry-level teachers, would that reduce your, in other words, have no, uh, no tenure? Maybe they're better. What? We don't have a metric to measure that. Are you asking if that would be cheaper, or are you asking if that would? Would it be cheaper? Not quite sure your question. Would it be cheaper to, to keep hiring the, uh, no, no people coming in with with the experience. Just higher entry sure. level. Sure. Cheaper. It might not be better. Sure. It'd probably be cheaper. Would it, it be better? Be would it be better? Would be you know. Well, would it be would it be better educationally to increase class sizes? Yeah. I mean. Yeah, there's a lot of variables that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if if Jason's going to get us information on this within I don't know would we have it by the next meeting? Why would we? handcuff ourselves and vote for this tonight instead of waiting and voting on it at the next meeting why not have two options and wait for more information rather than omit one option and say right now tonight we're going to omit the option of of having the ratio increase or the ratio stay the same rather than just the staff numbers stay the same and the population of students go up yeah, we have that. It was because we that was part of the meeting. information that had been presented, yeah. and so we have that. That won't be any trouble of getting that to the board. Um, there was a Jason's going to go upstairs and see if he can find that information. There was also a question about the, uh, the teacher staffing levels. This is data that we've been tracking for some time now. Uh, the, the question was, uh, who's all included in this? This is the classroom teachers, and as Melissa said, it doesn't include then guidance counselors and uh, uh, um, school nurses, um, all, all those types of positions which aren't assigned a daily um, instructional class or group. And as Melissa said, this is uniformly collected across the state of Wisconsin because it's in DPI reporting. So these are like staff members, and this is a... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, okay, so I'm struggling here because I want you to see the whole chart, but then you want to see the index too. There you go. Uh, that's about as best we're going to do. So Holman is the dark blue dot, uh, which back in 1999 uh, we had the highest number of students compared to staff members and you can see the trend where Holman reduced the number of students served by staff members over that time period while the MVC average being the pink line and the state average being the yellow line. Does this include special education teachers too? And uh, the data that we have on special education indicates that our percentage of special education students is no different than the state average or MVC average. In fact, I think it's a little bit less the last time we checked. We also studied whether or not the free and reduced count, that is socioeconomic status of students, may require higher staffing levels because of the at-risk needs. And uh, again, our population is probably lower on percentage free and reduced uh, than the comparable pools. And, and, and I don't want my misunderstood here either. I'm not saying we want to go high here with this either, but I just think given some of the other unmet budget issues, we continue to talk about technology, we continue to talk about you know, some of the other things, and that being so um, high, I guess, in, in some of these metrics, there probably is some room to, to swing that back a little bit. Obviously, we're not, I'm not advocating a huge radical change in that, 
but you know we're we're looking at a lot of districts that are cutting staff and it's a good problem to have we're talking about the, the decision whether to hold our hold the line or increase there's a lot of districts talking about cutting and I think our relative rank in, in student people is probably going to stay the same and probably still be number one um, just because the other districts are faced with far more I guess dire consequences of having to cut staff so uh, Mr. Austin's gonna be loading information here I'm gonna uh, mute this out for just a moment Okay, just loading this up quick. There's going to be quite a bit of information here, but Okay, so resident students in district. So this is one of the starting points with our evaluation of students. This is using a two-year cohort method. So looking at the number of students um, in 2012 here, our current year, fiscal year 2012-13, 3708, and 2014 going up to 3800. So this kind of gives you an, uh, a fairly good snapshot of, of the residents and, and the transition of those residents up through the grade levels here. Notice we've got a really, really small population here in the senior class. That's dropping off. Those students continue to progress through that. We have to make some assumptions at the 4K level. We have to make some, some assumptions at the early childhood level and then also at the 5K level as well. But this gives you a good snapshot of, of what we're looking at and forecasting forward using this method. Of course, there's other methods. There's um, other methods you know, developed by other um, agencies and whatnot that we have used, one that we used last year. But this is one method of, of projecting that forward. So this doesn't really get at, OK, exactly what grade level. I mean, you could look here and, and look at the different grade levels, but it is only, you know, carrying some of those forward and anticipating those increases at those grade levels. And just because my memory is not fabulous, um, did we use the 0.4 or the 0.7 projected growth last year? And if so, then did we approve one or two new teachers last year? The beginning of the first remember? Uh, net across the district, or mm -hmm. because I know at the elementary level, um, the net two contingent positions that were approved. Um, I, I'm not sure what the net. I have to follow up to see in the end because we have recently. Um, we'd have to look at that exactly what was. Uh, that net result district-wide. I know that, uh, for example, at elementary, we had originally forecasted a reduction of three, as you may recall. But again, as enrollments uh, went up through the summer and so on, came back to the board, asked, um, we, had, we had put three into contingency and we ended up needing that. And then at that time, I asked for two more in contingency, which we did not need, we actually utilized some of that in a different way for other positions. So I don't have the net district-wide uh, result for this past <coughs> year on staffing. Not with me. So if this is voted on tonight and it's passed the way Tim has worded it, does that tie our hands in no. the spring? If, no. if you come to us and mm -hmm. say, I need to hire three or four more teachers, we can say, well, no, mm -hmm. because Tim worded it that we can't hire additional staff. All it's going to no. is, is, do, do is use the math of zero increase when trying to 
I need to take our best guess at yep. the budget. That's all. That's all it's going to do. Yep. Doesn't tie the okay, future. Okay. Well, why don't we vote? Because th this conversation really, we don't need to mm -hmm. beat a dead horse. Nope. So. Okay. So there's been a motion and a second. Any more conversation? Um, all those in favor of Tim's motion to approve only option 9.4A signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. 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 Um, I hands. think the motion, yeah, show of hands. Um, aye. Okay. Motion passed. All right. Mrs. Oh, I'm sorry. I make a motion um, to move into executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of administrative contract renewals and per Wisconsin Statute 19.851D for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel regarding pending claim against the district. And would you do a roll call vote? Is there a second? I second it. All right. Joe Giddens? Yes. Anita Jagodinsky? Yes. Kate Mayer? Yes. Tim Menninger? Yes. Myself? Yes. Gary Dunlap? Yes. All right. We'll take a five-minute break. And we'll come back.